Hello, everybody. Welcome to the talk. Uh, the topic today is how small businesses can prepare for big attacks. It's a pretty strong pain point. I'm sure many of you uh, understand that uh, you know sometimes there's a smaller budget with the smaller business, and so how do you secure your assets the same way that the big guys do? Here's a quick overview of what I'll be talking about. So I'll introduce myself, tell you the purpose of the talk, any misconceptions that I commonly hear from small and medium-sized businesses, uh, some statistics and data points about uh, SMB-targeted cyber attacks. And when I say SMB in this talk, I'm talking about small to medium-sized businesses, not the other thing. Uh, I'll go over some free with an asterisk and simple solutions, and then, of course, paid services and how they help you, and then the key takeaways afterwards. So who am I? A uh, cybersecurity professional with about a decade of experience. I've started out in the Air Force. Um, I was doing cyber warfare operations for several years. Uh, got my bachelor's degree while I was in. I mentored with something called Cyber Patriot, if any of you are familiar. It's essentially where uh, Air Force uh, personnel were kind of encouraged to mentor high school students and college students in cybersecurity. Um, we went through labs, we, they had competitions. It was a really fun time, I loved it, uh, every second of it. We had one team one year go to state and that was awesome for me. So um, definitely proud of that time. Uh, I've got multiple disciplines in my experience. My bread and butter is digital forensics and incident response, DFIR. Uh, I do a lot of threat hunting as well. I'm actually building a threat hunting program at my company currently. Uh, security information event management engineering, that's kind of how I started in the Air Force, malware reverse engineer, and a bunch of other stuff. I did spend some time as a senior analyst over at CrowdStrike. I learned a ton. Uh, I've got some, some old coworkers here as well. It was a great time. I loved every minute of it. And now I'm currently the incident response lead over at a company called Tanium, and we do endpoint uh, management solutions uh, for enterprises, but I do their internal incident response. And I'm a huge nerd. <laughs> uh, I play tons of video games, and I am all about the, the nerd culture as well. So why am I here? Well, every organization in the world is a target of a cyber attack. No matter what, hands down, full stop, every single organization, every single individual is a target. No matter how big or small, you're a target too. So SMBs usually don't even know what they need when it comes to cybersecurity. Uh, usually it's an afterthought for them, right? It's only after they get attacked do they even care about cybersecurity. So I want to clear up some misconceptions around the cybersecurity industry, the products, the services that are offered throughout the industry, and to kind of clear up some information that might have been falsely understood. And then I want to help the underprepared organizations secure their assets, because that's what we do, right? We protect uh, company assets or government organization assets and information and data. We want to make sure that all of that data is protected the proper way. That's why we're here. And so in, as a result of that, we can make the world just a little bit safer. So let's jump right into some misconceptions. These are just uh, a handful of quotes that I've heard from small and medium-sized business owners, one of which is the misconception that recovery of a cyber attack happens just like any other disaster, right? So if your building gets flooded out because of a hurricane, well, you have disaster recovery processes that you follow in order to bring back uh, the functionality of that building. And so they just assume that you would do it in a similar way when it's a cyber attack. And as many of you know, that is not true. So cyber attacks come with many other costs that are not directly upfront with just, say, a fine from a government organization, or I don't know, it could be you know, rebuilding a server that got ransomware, something like that, or say paying a ransomware payment. Those are not the only costs that are associated with it. When you have a major cyber attack and critical information or data is released to the public or maybe customer data is sold on the dark web, 
the public trust on your brand has gone down significantly, and as a result, you're probably going to see a significant drop in revenue because you are now less trusted in the world. So if you don't fix the underlying issue after the cyber attack, it's just gonna happen again. Uh, unlike, say, flooding, where you, know, you can't really do much about a hurricane coming in and just flooding out an entire city. You can take precautions to help mitigate the risk of it, but you can't stop it completely. However, when it's a cyber attack, let's say you accidentally left a Windows XP box uh, with <laughs> the other SMB uh, open to the internet, you're probably just gonna get hacked, and then if you recover from that attack and then you don't fix that underlying issue, somebody else is just gonna use it again. I'm too small to be a target. As I already said in the beginning, that's completely false. Attackers don't care about how big or how much revenue you have. They don't care about any of that. They target everybody, regardless of size. Attackers may be going after thousands of organizations just like yours, maybe the same size, maybe the same industry, but if they only went after the big fish, say Walmart, Apple, uh, Adobe, whatever, then they wouldn't really get that big of a payout because they have a bigger security budget, they have more infrastructure that, and, and more investment into cybersecurity controls. But if it's a smaller target, you may get a lower amount of payout, but it's gonna be more reliable. So if I hit 1,000 organizations and only 10% of them stick, I still hit 100 organizations. So it's easy money, right? Um, if you have very little to no cybersecurity protections implemented in your environments, then it's just an easy button for them and they can get right in. Couple more, we don't have the budget for in-depth cybersecurity. Well, you don't really need that. You don't need millions and millions of dollars to build a proper cybersecurity uh, program or a strategy even. Uh, most of the time, you can get by with a handful of free or simple solutions that you can implement in your organization and it will put you far ahead of everybody else in your industry for their cybersecurity. Well, cybersecurity is too complicated for my simple little business. Well, again, most of those cheap and free solutions, they're usually pretty easy to implement, such as password managers or an antivirus software. It's pretty easy to just kind of install on the host and then just let it go. They also help to stop the most common attacks. Who here knows what the most common attack is? Like way uh, entry level, sorry, uh, infection vector that attackers will take to get into an organization. Email, thank you, I heard it. Uh, phishing attacks, right? So if you had proper uh, email filtering in place, then less phishing emails will even be allowed to get through for your employees to click on. And that's just one of the many examples out there. So let's talk about some SMB targeted or uh, cyber attacks that have happened in the past. So obviously, SMBs tend to have less security controls in their organization. As we discussed earlier, lower cybersecurity budget, uh, they probably don't even have dedicated personnel that handle cybersecurity. So the security patching might not be managed very well. It could be just like, yeah, whenever Jeff from IT has time, he'll go ahead and review the patch schedule or something. Most likely no security awareness training or phishing training. So phishing awareness uh, is going to be one of the biggest helpers to reduce the risk for phishing attacks, and it's a free solution that you can implement. Um, obviously, you wanna make sure that it's good training, <laughs> so it might take a little bit of time and research in order to get there. So they're also unaware of their attack surface. Uh, they, don't, they may not necessarily have a good asset management system in place, and so whenever a, a particular server is actually compromised by an attacker, they might not even know that that system even existed because somebody else implemented it and didn't go through the proper channels in order to get that system put into the asset management system. And then of course, like I already said, lower security budget. Less money means less resources and you are putting it at a lower priority than other parts of the business. 
and you're just opening yourself up to risk. So organizations with less than 100 employees are actually targeted more often than others. Uh, so about 60% of all cyber attacks are targeted at SMBs. And uh, as we already discussed, phishing remains the most common tactic for initial access. And of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has increased cybercrime by over 600% since it uh, started. So I'm going to add a little bit more uh, information about some statistics on the cyber attacks that are targeted at these types of organizations. Uh, according to the DFIR, DFIR report by Verizon last year, earlier this year, excuse me, uh, only about 50% of SMBs had a cybersecurity plan for 2022. Um, that's kind of alarming because that means that when the attack happened, they had no idea what they were going to do, right? They had no backup plan. They didn't have a strategy for how to handle and how to triage the incident or how to recover from it, none of that. During the time frame of 2020 to 2021, data breaches at these SMBs, they grew 152% in comparison to the previous two years. Of course, 27% of small businesses with no cybersecurity protections collect credit card info. So that's good to know. 82% of ransomware attacks were against companies with fewer than 1,000 employees. So that would be con anything lower than 1,000 employees would be considered a small to medium sized business. And so the fact that 82% of all ransomware cases were targeted at those organizations should be alarming to most people because I'm sure many of you here work for organizations that have less than 1,000 people. So that means that that's more work for you <laughs> and um, it's more lucrative for the attackers in the long run. More than half of the respondents to a survey uh, would be less likely to continue doing business after a breach. And we see this all the time. Uh, cyber attack happens, maybe ransomware gets spread throughout the entire environment and they had no backup plan, they had no BCDR plan implemented, and then as a result of that, they lost so much money during the recovery process that they ended up going bankrupt and they had to close business. Nobody wants that to happen. And of course, finally, over half of SMBs that fall victim to ransomware, they pay the money, and you shouldn't do that. Uh, the reason for this is because when you pay the ransom to the ransomware actor, you are reinforcing the fact that that is now a lucrative business for them to continue pursuing. And that you also have tipped your hand to other criminals that you're willing to pay the ransom note. So not only are you opening up yourself to more cyber attacks, you're opening up the entire world to more cyber attacks when you pay the ransom. So don't do that if you can avoid it. <laughs> so free with an asterisk because it may not have a price associated with it, but there is a time commitment that you will have to put in for these solutions, just like with most things. But there will be no monetary price that you have to pay to a company for these products or solutions. Enable multi-factor authentication on every possible thing. And when I say that, I mean your corporate accounts is what I'm specifically talking about here. Every time that you have the ability to add multi-factor authentication, you should definitely enable it. And if you're the business owner or you're an executive at these small to medium-sized businesses, you should make that a requirement of every single employee there. Using a password manager in the correct way is important. Patching and updating, as we mentioned earlier, if you don't have a good patching and management uh, system in place and you have well-documented evidence on how this is all handled and when a new critical security patch comes out, uh, you need to be able to make sure that every vulnerable system has been patched within a timely manner. You can create an in-house phishing awareness training. It'll take some time and research if you're not familiar with performing these types of trainings for your company but it's definitely worth it, because as we've said already multiple times, phishing is the number one attack vector. So once you have the phishing awareness training in place, you can also 
do phishing tests slash you know, simulations to help reinforce that training in all of your employees. So one thing that I've seen some companies do is they'll send out a fake phishing email that um, is clearly not legitimate. And the link that is in there that they're trying to entice you to click just brings you to the phishing awareness training itself for your company. And that's a good solution. Uh, it does help. It's not perfect. Nothing is in security. <laughs> but uh, it definitely reduces the amount of risk exponentially. The more people that do this training and uh, understand it and they go through simulations, they become more vigilant. Because now they're looking for the simulations, which means that they're looking at the real phishing emails. They're like, oh, that's probably a simulation. I'm not clicking on that. You know, I don't want my name to be on that list today. Uh, so you're helping out. Uh, overall by doing something like that. Uh, implement policies and procedures in your organization. So uh, this again is targeted more at the executives or management of the, the company. But essentially what you can do is you can make all of these cybersecurity awareness trainings and everything like that a mandatory task for everybody. And how you implement that kind of varies by person to person on their opinions on how it should be implemented. But for basically like a blanket statement, you should make sure that strong security practices and best practices uh, are being promoted by the executive leadership so that way all employees will follow it, overarching, reducing the risk of the company, uh, of the cyber attack, sorry. So one such policy uh, or I guess you can say um, a best practice would be least privilege. And this is something that you don't necessarily need money to uh, implement. It. And the reason is because you probably already have some type of mechanism that you um, have a separation of duties for people, right? Why does somebody in this department need information that's in this other department if they have nothing to do with it? We'll block that access. That's basically the principle of least privilege. You want to make sure that people only have access to what they need to have access to and nothing more. If they need that access later, they can request it and they can go through the process that you have set up. And I'm an incident response guy, so of course the incident response plan I'm going to be talking about. Um, too often I have seen it where organizations have no idea what they're going to do in the case of a major breach. And that's how you do it right there. You do an incident response plan. You need to identify the biggest risks to your environment. And then you need to set up a plan of if these systems get attacked, what are we going to do? And this helps for a couple of reasons. And the biggest one is muscle memory. So if you have a small team of uh, IT engineers or something along those lines, and you don't have any dedicated security personnel, there's not going to be many people in your organization who already know what they need to do in the case of a major breach. So what you do is you build an incident response plan, and then you test it. So that way, every single person in that organization who is responsible to perform certain actions during the incident response, they know exactly what they need to do. Another big issue that I see with not having an incident response plan is that you might miss something in the heat of the moment. So if you're getting attacked by, I don't know, WannaCry, for instance, and you don't have an incident response plan, and you think you know what you're doing because you're a cybersecurity professional, you got this, right? Well, maybe you missed something. Maybe you forgot to check one log source. Maybe you forgot to quarantine one machine, something like that. And then the ransomware is still active on your network, even when you think you're done with it. Having an incident response plan is, in my opinion, absolutely crucial. Having playbooks or runbooks follows along the same lines. In this type of scenario, what are we going to do? So in the case of ransomware, it has a step-by-step -step process or general guidelines of what needs to happen in order to ensure that the ransomware stops being spread you can contain it and you can eradicate it. Going more into multi-factor authentication, it's obviously far more secure than just a password alone. So instead of only typing in a username and password to log into any system, 
you will also have to have that second factor. And that could be anything from an authenticator app on your phone to a text message, an email, um, and then of course you also have biometrics. So many of us have phones that have fingerprint scanners, face scanners, uh, those types of solutions. Those would also be considered a second factor uh, authentication process. This also means that there's more steps for the attacker. So now not only do they have to somehow get your username and password, but now they also have to figure out how to get that second factor authentication to be utilized in the authentication process in order to break into your account. So moving on to password managers and how to use them correctly, they enforce strong, uh, or sorry, you should enforce a strong master password. So your, your master password is what unlocks essentially your vault of all of your other passwords that you don't have to remember because they're stored in a vault. So if you have a really, really strong uh, master password and multi-factor authentication on your password manager, it'll be far less likely that an attacker can gain access to that account. And since you're using a password manager, you only got to remember the one. Right? Single sign-on is another solution for this, but that's a little bit more on the enterprise side. So after you have a very strong master password, what about all the other accounts? Well, I want you to just randomly generate 20 plus character long passwords because you don't even have to remember them. You're just gonna store them in the password manager anyways. So add in characters, symbols, uppercase, lowercase numbers, all of that stuff and make it long, strong, and you're gonna feel more safe now because who's gonna be able to guess that kind of password? You also have the ability to monitor account access and other critical logs. So now, I put an asterisk here as well. Usually it's a paid service add-on for these password manager services. Excuse me. Um, however, there are ways that you can utilize that to your advantage that are well worth the money, in my opinion. So what does this actually mean? What does it actually do for these SMBs? Well, they can now monitor who is accessing what systems at what times, and sometimes you can even e get the GPS location of the individual where they logged in from. So this provides more insight into what is happening with all of the accounts across the enterprise. So, on implementing policy and procedures, establishing security as part of your culture is huge. Uh, anybody ever heard of Google? You know, small company. Uh, they, uh, several years ago, they implemented a requirement for all employees to use FIDO tokens, which are physical devices that you have to plug into the computer as your second factor authentication. Who here knows how many times Google's accounts have been, like, sorry, internal accounts have been compromised? Zero. Not a single time since they implemented that uh, policy and that that security is part of their culture, have they had any of their internal accounts compromised as a result? So establishing security as part of this culture is going to help you reduce risk tenfold. And it's because people are the weak link. So most attacks, such as phishing, you know, social engineering, they, uh, they don't attack any particular system, right? They're not really an attack in the traditional sense. What they are is they're attacking the person and their human mind to trick it into clicking something or downloading something that then drops malware or a reverse shell or whatever else. So if you establishing, sorry, if you establish the security as part of the culture in your entire company, then you shouldn't have to worry about that as much. It's still going to be there, but the overall risk will be reduced. Just like I was talking about earlier, make sure that you create a plan for how you're going to respond to the most common attacks. If ransomware is your biggest threat, then make a playbook for ransomware. What are you going to do when it happens? Because, again, just because you're a small business or you think that you're not a good target, think again, because you definitely are. I'm including here 
incident response plan, ransomware playbook, stuff like that. Require MFA on all critical accounts for all employees. I kind of discussed that earlier. And of course, encourage behavior related to security. And what I mean by this is if you see something, say something, is usually how people will put it. If you see something or if you observe a practice or a person in the company performing a certain action that doesn't seem very secure, encourage the behavior of reporting that and not reprimanding people for reporting that. Um, obviously, that will have to be reported somewhere, so if you don't have a process for that, you should probably do that. And I have seen this catch uh, threats and active attacks multiple times, where somebody was just like, hey, my computer was acting funny and I didn't know what was going on, so I, you know, I'm su submitting a ticket to the help desk. And then the help desk picks it up and they're like, oh, this doesn't look very good. And then they send it off to the security operations center to triage. Turns out there was malware on that system. So obviously whatever security, technical security controls they implemented on that host did not work. And so having the person identify something as not correct and reporting it, that's what actually caught it. So encouraging that as part of the culture, huge. Of course, reporting phishing attempts is another major example here. So whenever a phishing email comes in, either suspected or legitimate, you want to be able to have a process in place for employees to report that email because they might not be the only person that got it and did not click, right? There could be multiple people that got that same exact email and maybe none of them reported it except for one person. Now you can go into your email software and you can search for all the people who have been given this email and you can continue your triage from there. Identifying security threats and vulnerabilities, then reporting them to the security team. I kind of already went over that, but essentially, if you see, uh, you know, you're running an old version of PHP on your website and for some reason nobody has patched it, say something, bring it up. That's going to help you immensely. So now I'm going to be moving on to paid services and how they help you. No, I'm not going to be selling you anything. <laughs> so of course, the big one, malware protection and antivirus, right? Everybody knows this. It's been around forever. Um, you know, you got McAfee, you got malware bytes, you've got all sorts of stuff. You even got the new cool ones like CrowdStrike and Sentinel One and all that. But for the most part, that gets a little too complicated for these SMBs because now you're starting to get very in-depth into the cybersecurity field and the expertise that it requires to understand how these systems actually work, they obviously don't have time for that. So it's not your mama's AV software anymore. It's kind of how I like to put it. It's a lot more sophisticated than it used to be, and it helps way more than the old school antiviruses that you used to put on your computer from Best Buy in 2005. It's crucial to have but unfortunately, it's not enough by itself. And we're going to go over that a little bit more in a couple slides, so I'm going to hold off on that. Email filtering and phishing protection, we were going over that as well. So since phishing is the most common uh, initial excuse me, infection vector, um, having the ability to filter out potential phishing emails is huge. So it will stop most phishing attempts when configured properly, and it helps so much more than you think it does, because a human element still plays a big role here. If there are less, uh, less emails that get to your employees to click on, then just by statistics stake, less emails will be clicked on. It's crucial to have, but again, not enough by itself. Backup services, BCDR, right? Business continuity and disaster recovery. I know it's boring, nobody likes to talk about it, but it's important and we need to have it. If you get ransomware across all of your DCs and you don't have any backups or any plan to recover from that attack, then you're kind of just dead in the water. So having these backup services that are off-site, another critical point there, making sure that they're off-site, could be in the cloud, maybe you have your own 
data center, whatever the case is, making sure that those backups are not stored on the same server that you're backing them up from, huge. And again, crucial to have, should be required on all critical systems. And then, another very key point here, you have to test the backups. Because you can't just point to say, oh yeah, we got backups, it's fine, and then three years later, ransomware hits you, and then come to find out, three years ago, somebody forgot to push a configuration file to make sure that they can actually work properly. So make sure that you test these and you run through BCDR tests. So you can get policy and plan reviews by the third party services. So this kind of ties in with what I was talking about with the incident response plans, all the playbooks and the run books. You can actually have cybersecurity companies that review these plans for you, provide you with um, you know, recommendations to make them better or changes that they think you should implement, best practices that they notice you didn't have included, and they can also work with you to tailor these plans and these um, policies to your organization, because every organization is unique and you'll have different infrastructure depending on what industry you're in and all that. And that you can identify the gaps, improve your response, and then standardizing your workflow because if you have uh, three different people doing three different processes for the same malware or the same type of attack, you're gonna get three different results. So standardizing that is going to be immensely helpful when you're trying, trying to identify the actual underlying issue. Security assessments is another uh, major one. All this talk about going to the cloud, most of these SMBs are moving to the cloud or they're starting out in the cloud and maybe they don't understand it very well or maybe they only kind of understand how it works and they're like, oh, my engineers just handle that. Um, if you don't get your environment checked by somebody else, like a third party, then you might be missing something. And it's important to make sure that you're filling in all the gaps as consistently as possible. Security assessments, uh, honestly, you can get away with doing them once a year. I would recommend probably every six months because your infrastructure is probably changing more often than you think it is. And so verifying that your configurations are implemented properly or you don't have exposed credentials on some Amazon S3 bucket or whatever, those are probably going to save you from a major breach. So you could do on-prem or cloud-focused, maybe both. It just depends on your unique environment. You can get recommendations on improvement areas from, uh, again, cybersecurity professionals and experts. Next one is going to be risk assessments around cyber attacks. This one will be a little bit more focused on the overarching strategy of your company. And essentially, uh, it will be more focused on less technical controls and more managerial or process focused controls. So very much focused on the executives and management of an organization. They translate the technical issues into the business terms that they can understand. Most of the time, these small businesses, they only have a handful of technical people, maybe you know a couple engineers or uh, a couple help desk individuals, something along those lines. Being able to speak in terms that these business owners understand is going to help them immensely. Attack surface management uh, services, these can also help you more than you think they can. And the reason is, like I was talking about earlier, sometimes you just don't even know what all systems you have under your organization. You could have 3,000 machines out there, but then whatever system you're using to identify those assets, it might say something like 2,700. And so in your eyes, you're like, wow, I have 2,700 systems. That's a lot, but you're still missing 300. So being able to have an attack surface management service, usually what they'll have is a continuous monitoring um, of your entire organization. And then any new asset that they identify, they will immediately put it into an automated report and provide that to you. This could also identify rogue devices on your network as well. 
So if you're in a traditional building with traditional networking and everything like that, and an attacker tries to throw in a rogue device to maybe capture some traffic or you know, just kind of poke and prod, see what you got out there, now that, net, that device was added to your network and your attack service management system will identify that for you. And then you know, if you have an IT department, they're gonna be like, I don't know what the system is. Does anybody know what it is? And then when they identify that nobody even knows what the heck is going on, that's when they know that there's an issue that needs to be investigated. And of course, uh, public facing as well is very huge because that's gonna be what most ha attackers have automated attacks going after. They're just port scanning constantly. And if you accidentally spin up some EC2 instance that has some service public facing that's vulnerable to an exploit, it's gonna get smacked. And then I'm gonna bring this back around to phishing simulations as well. You don't have to do them yourself. There are tons of companies out there that offer those services for you. So this is what I wanted to bring up earlier, is that a lot of these security solutions are great or critical even at the, um, for, sorry, they're very critical for everything, uh, every organization out there, but not by themselves. There's this um, defense in depth concept saying that you can't just use one security solution, you have to use multiple it's layers, kind of like an onion. Uh, and you want it to be harder and harder for the attacker to get in in between. This graphic was just uh, one that I found online. I did not make it, but it just kind of hits some, some major points here about you know, timely patching, encryption sensitive data, excuse me, encrypting sensitive data, and of course your antiviruses and your uh, policies and procedures, physical security, so if you have uh, traditional old school servers that you have sitting in your own building, then you're gonna want to make sure that you have physical access control, CCTV coverage, all of that is part of the security of your organization as well. Um, the defense in depth strategy is going to change from organization to organization. It, uh, some of these might not uh, affect your business at all. For instance, physical security. You might not need that. You might be a remote only organization. So you don't really need any physical security. Uh, so none of these are you know, hard points that you need to have, but you wanna make sure that the concept of defense in depth is implemented within your organization. So I ended up talking faster than I thought. So here's some key takeaways. <laughs> Criminals don't care about you or your organization. They don't care if you're going through a hard time. They don't care if you just had a baby. They don't care if it's three o'clock in the morning. They're going to attack you when they have the opportunity. And they don't care about your organization either. Um, if they can make a quick buck off of you, that's all they care about. SMBs are much bigger targets than you think, as we discussed with the statistics from the DFIR reports. Basic security measures go further than you think. Uh, some of them are even free. So implementing best practices alone will probably save you from more cyber attacks than you actually think they would. If it's in your budget, consider a low cost third party to assist. Again, I'm not trying to sell you anything here. Uh, but they are helpful. If you're not familiar with the solutions and the terms that I'm using here for the cybersecurity industry, it would be highly beneficial to get a low-cost third-party assessment of your environment and then have them provide you with recommendations or maybe even that, that company offers to do the remediations or the changes for you. And preparation is the most important part. So in the incident response life cycle, the first step is preparation. And then you go through everything else. <laughs> in my opinion, preparation is the most important part. It's not containment, it's not eradication, it's none of that. It's preparation because if you're not prepared, then none of the other parts of the life cycle matter. It all crumbles because you need to have a plan. You need to understand what the risks are for your organization and you need to be able to respond in a timely manner 
or else the attackers are just going to own your company. Thank you for your time. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I've got my Twitter and my LinkedIn up there as well uh, if you guys want to connect. Yeah, you talk, you touched on a lot of different services that uh, small businesses could use, but one thing that I noticed wasn't in there is talking about MSSPs. And I was just wondering, is that, would that be pretty critical to a small business? Yeah, so uh, MSSPs stand for Managed Security Service Provider. Um, and essentially, most of the services that I discussed here are actually included in most MSSP service offerings. So while an MSSP is not one service in and of itself, they could have multiple services. They do have one other that I didn't bring up, which would be like a SOC as a service. So a security operations center that this MSSP has stood up, and then you just ship all of your logs to them, and they do the analysis, the triage, and all of that. So you're kind of offloading that work to another organization, and then they provide you with the feedback, or some of them will even do remediations for you, stuff like that. Does that answer your question? Anybody else? Thank you for your time.